Russia has invaded, controlled, occupied, split this bit of the world for many, many centuries, way before the existence of NATO. It's kind of, you know, the, the, the sort of the, the desire and the sense of the right to control Eastern Europe is, is very much embedded within, within, you know, Russia's claims to be an empire and claims which is, it's never really relinquished. Hi, I'm Emily Tampkin. Today, I'm speaking to Peter Pomerantsev. Peter is a senior fellow at Johns Hopkins University and author, most recently, of This Is Not Propaganda. Peter, thank you so much for being with me today. My pleasure. To start out, one of the big stories this week heading into this new year is um, is Russia and Ukraine. Russia has been building up troops on the Ukrainian border. There's fears that it will sort of start restart the, the hot war that we saw back in 2014. One never wants to ask what what does Putin want? What what you know? What is the Kremlin thinking? But I guess I'll put it to you like this: that same question in a slightly different way, which is why, of all the things that Russia could be doing right now, is it doing this? Like what you know? There's there's its own domestic scene. There is a pandemic. Why why is it important to the Russian authorities? To be doing that, to, to, to be to be pursuing this particular strategy with respect to Ukraine. So, firstly, this is not just about Ukraine. Uh, this is about Russia, its status, Putin's domestic status, and it's about America as well. So, um, really, quite a long time ago, Putin became a foreign policy president. The people around him talked about this very openly when he returned to the presidency um, after his sort of weird hiatus as prime minister. Um, they were very open. We've done everything we can domestically. Russia is now off its knees. It's flourishing. He's the greatest leader since Peter the Great, Ivan the Terrible, whoever you want. We've done it domestically. Now is our foreign policy moment. They were very open about that. Uh, Russia is returning to the global stage and to the top table where it belongs. You can see the first uh, invasion of Ukraine as a series of miscalculations, <laughs> sort of following from that announcement, or quite the opposite, as brilliant opportunism. You know, it's still, uh, uh, the evidence is, is still not there for us to really make that decision. We'll only know, you know, probably decades from now when this regime falls. But, you know, there is a foreign policy kind of movement. There's not that many options that he has, actually. I mean, he played around in Syria, um, he plays around with your elections, which is kind of a sport, really, I think. Um, but the serious stuff is around Ukraine. This is kind of where both Russia's status as a great power plays out, whether it can control Ukraine. Um, and it's also the most vulnerable promise that America has almost given, though America has ever promised. It's sort of in the air that somehow America is supporting Ukraine. Certainly Ukraine, again, invokes it in language, if, even if there's no specific pledge. So it's an underbelly, you know, you can discredit America, you can make it look um, feeble, confused and full of hot air really very easily. Um, twin that with China doing stuff in Taiwan, and then you have this historic moment to really, you know, change and shape the course of global politics. There's been this debate happening in Washington recently, you know, is this because of NATO enlargement? Is this, did the United States provoke Russia into doing this. Do you think it sounds from listening to you like it's not at least not only about NATO enlargement and the threat of continued NATO enlargement, but but what do you make of that of that argument that, that sort of the U.S. and its Western partners pushed Russia into this course of action? So if you look at I mean, if you look at, I don't know, the autobiographies and memoirs of mass murderers, they always feel they're attacked. If you look at um, Hitler and Goebbels' rationale for expansionism, it's always we were under attack. But this kind of, you know, very, very kind of hysterical rhetoric of victimhood that you hear from Russia is, is, is a real sign of, of, you know, a lot of demons that are happening inside. So I'd, I'd be very, very cautious with that. Overall, I think NATO enlargement did the opposite. It you know, created more security in a very volatile bit of the world than we probably ever had. And look, if you don't buy my kind of specious uh, uh, sort of like metaphors uh, about neuroses, which, you know, I've, I'm saying with a huge pinch of salt, um, and if you, you know, don't buy or you don't care, which I think is closer to the truth about security in Eastern Europe, and you just care about great power politics, you can also look at history. Russia has invaded, controlled occupied, split this bit of the world for many, many centuries, way before the existence of NATO. The desire and the sense of the right to control Eastern Europe is, is very much embedded 
within within you know Russia's claims to be an empire and claims which is it's never really relinquished. So, where does this leave Ukraine? A thing that we talk about on this podcast often is this, or have spoken about often on this podcast, is this idea that well. Ukraine matters so much more to Russia than it does to the United States, and therefore there's limited there's there's limited action that the United States can take, um, which means that there's limited support that it's going to offer Ukraine. We've spoken about how how Russia sees this and what Ukraine means to Russia's sort of view of its own history and view of itself. Um, but what does that mean for for Ukraine? Well, I think Ukrainians are very kind of you know the most kind of grounded people in this whole story. They've been fighting for seven years. Um, and also, if you look at Ukraine's cultural history, which is actually different to Russia's, even though a lot of there's a lot of confusion, I think, still in America that they're, they're the same uh, in some way. Um, if you look at Ukraine historically, I mean, th- th- there's a reason that the historian Tim Snyder sort of refers to this bit of the world as the bloodlands. I mean, this is a, a bit of the world where in World War One anybody with a weapon was, you know, invading, raping, pillaging, slaughtering one after the other. It's since the Second World War where, you know, the most blood is is sort of spilt. It's a place where like trauma, mass murder and war is, is, is kind of historically very present. And if you go to Ukraine and if you spend time there, which, which I do, and I do a lot of social research there, or focus groups, hundreds of hours over the, over, over the last year, actually, um, what you find is this incredible adaptability, resilience, and a kind of this really wonderful attitude to life, which is informed by by a kind of a shrug and an eye roll, you know, mm. well, Putin's still not Stalin, you know, maybe, maybe a few hundred thousand will die, we're used to millions. I mean, I'm saying that you know, very, very bitter and dark humour, but but um, the one thing Ukrainians are incredibly good at is is being resilient and surviving through trauma, and they they can they can switch that on. That's kind of where Ukraine is, but but I think everybody there understands that this is a this is a real war and a real enemy that will stop a few things. How is the attitude that you just described? How is it different from twenty fourteen? You know, is is there less is there less of a sense of surprise that this is happening than there was in twenty fourteen? Is there more of a will it will it be harder for Russia to make um, inroads in Ukraine? I mean, I, I guess what you know we've spoken about. There's been a lot of focus on how things have changed for Russia in the past seven years. I think maybe there's been less talk about how things have changed for Ukraine since 2014. They've built up a much more competent army. They now have a generation who fought. They have um, a generation who've shown themselves ready to die, which still in our kind of, you know, are, are making sense of what a nation is. A nation is when ordinary people are prepared to die for it. That's kind of, in many ways, the definition of a nation. Um, so, so they've proven that they are in that sense, a nation. The question much more is, is, is Russia a nation? It's, it's Russia that refuses to reveal or speak openly to its own country about its invasion, that hides the sort of burial places of its soldiers um, who've died in the war in Ukraine. It's um, it's much more a question whether Russians are prepared to sac- make any sacrifices, real sacrifices, for invading uh, a neighbour. Ukraine's limitations are, and it's, and it's kind of... Um, psychological intent are kind of pretty obvious. They're sort of, we've seen them in the last seven years. Um, the question is, is, is Russia prepared to risk a real war uh, in the face of, of what will be some resistance? I just want to note for listeners who are perhaps not as familiar with this, that the argument that you're making flips this very common um, Russian refrain on its head, right? There are some in Russia, including in power in Russia, who say, oh, Ukraine is not, it's not a real nation. It's a fake nationalism. Um, and I mean, to the extent that any nationalism and any nation is real, what you're saying is that actually there's a there the Ukrainians have recently proven that they have this coherent nationhood and that it is yet to be seen if contemporary Russia has the same. Precisely. <laughs> Precisely, so, especially around an invasion, you know, invading somebody, not just in self-defense, but actually going out and being ready to die for some crazy fever dream. What you were just speaking about was was what you admit to, what you remember. Um, And this has been in the news in in Russia and for those around the world who are are following the stories from Russia um, for another reason, which is that toward the 
end of, of last year, at the very end of 2021, um, a Russian court ordered the, the Russian Supreme Court ordered the liquidation of Memorial. So Memorial is a human rights group. It is also an archival center um, that, that keeps track of the repressions of, of, among other things, Soviet history. Can you speak a bit about the significance of, of Memorial? The significance is is um, sort of uh, political symbolic on the one hand. Uh, this was a uh, Memorial's creation was one of the great moments of perestroika, so Gorbachev's reforms. It was kind of a real kind of moment where Russia said, "We're going to come to terms with our past. We're not going to be a dictatorship anymore." So it's you know we can talk about its significance in terms of cultural impact, but in terms of sort of cultural political significance, it's a real it's a real symbol. Um, so that's very important. And the fact they're closing it, it's a real kind of like, forget about, you know, whatever democratic gains were made, you know, obviously they've all been sort of murdered those gains the last few years, but it's a very symbolic act. It's always tempting very gingerly to, um, dive in and kind of, uh, psychoanalyze a nation. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's, it's a dangerous, it's a dangerous journalistic kind of indulgence, I suppose. But, but let's, let's, let's try to root it in something. There's a wonderful cultural historian, um, um, Alexander Etkin, who has this incredibly powerful book called Warped Morning, which is all about how Russia is a country that's never managed to come to terms with the traumas, the many, many traumas of its own past. He goes, he talks about how are there are no memorials to the fallen in World War I, how there's no memorials to the people who died in the gulag. There's no way of getting over, you know, the really, really deep, um, you know, psychological uh, uh, wounds of that. And, and I suppose one could argue that, 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 you know, when one doesn't come to terms with the past, one of the sort of expressions of that can become aggression. Again, I think we do have to sort of, you know, always caveat these kind of analyses with, 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 with a lot of sort of, uh, with, with a deal of irony, but but there seems something like that, you know, the, the, the extent to which Russia refuses to deal with the past, refuses to deal with its inner problems, then sort of is compensated for in these in these in these acts of aggression and this threatening behavior, which is also about the past, is also a misreading of the past, refuses to face up to the historical reality of Ukraine, the historical uh, genocide of, uh, of 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 Ukrainians by by the Kremlin. It's all sort of wrapped up, you know, the inability to face up to your own demons, to face up to history, this aggression. I mean, it gets very, very weird when you come to Ukraine because, you know, Kiev is known as the mother of all Russian cities. And, and there's this very strange thing in, in, in Russian propaganda discourse, which flips between calling uh, Ukraine its mother and we can't imagine ourselves as a country without Ukraine, which is one of the myths of, 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 kind of Russian imperialism, through to Ukraine's a whore, she's betrayed us, she's gone off to the West. And it, it's it's, you know... The, 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 these really kind of in-your-face psychological uh, um, tropes kind of infest Russia's discourse around Ukraine. So maybe we are allowed to, on our side as well, sort of try to probe what's going on in the Russian political unconscious. I think it can be hard for some, certainly it's hard for me to, to ask what is so, or to try to wrap my head around what is so threatening about an archival center. Right. Like I went to Memorial a decade ago to do like to look in the archives of a Soviet dissident for my undergrad thesis. You know, it was like it, it like this is what you're this is what you're liquidating. This is it's it's just records. The, the records are, themselves are not threatening. It's what if, if people want to use them to make a point that can that can be a threat, I suppose, if you're threatened by such things. But can you just speak a bit more about what it is about the preservation? It, it's It's literally just records from the past. What is so threatening about that. Let's not think that this doesn't happen in its own way in, in democracies as well. In America, we're seeing oh, including huge here, right? yes. about what can be taught about in schools, about, about right. you know, reconstruction, which is something that mm -hmm. happened like, you know, decades and decades ago, which some people perceive to be a threat to their Southern identity or something. The idea that history can sort of subvert um, um, narratives of national identity and cohesion and, and question them is, is, is something that uh, is particularly sharp in Russia, but, you know, we see it everywhere. The Russian elites have always taken propaganda, culture, and its power very seriously. I mean, it's a old Soviet tradition. I mean, why did they go off to poets in mm -hmm. the Soviet era? I mean, they both sort of, like, lifted them up. I mean, poets, poets are, you know, the least important people 
um, 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 aside from university lecturers. I mean, I can hard to think of, of people with, le- with less kind of day to day power. So they will, they've always been obsessed with kind of culture, with controlling culture as being really, really important. That, that might be a slight Russian obsession, um, elevating culture to that to that kind of primal, uh, primal level. Um, but, but, you know, Memorial create culture that way through their archives. They create narrative, they create stories, they create self-perceptions. That's one thing. Uh, there's also the, the sort of like, you know, the punitive action as a propaganda of the deed. You know, you go and kick somebody who seemed unkickable and, and sort of protected, those small. Memorial seemed sort of beyond reproach for so many people. You're really sending a signal. Like mm-hmm. even Memorial aren't protected. You know, even these guys aren't protected. You're sending a signal. You guys are certainly not protected. So, so in that sense, it's quite pragmatic as well. I just wanted to ask if there was anything else about the cultural impact, as opposed to the cultural political relevance of Memorial, that you think is worth worth noting. Which I guess is another way of asking what culturally is lost if this place is liquidated and they're not able to preserve. Their work. There's always this this hope that, that 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 Russia would come to terms with its Soviet past in a generation. It would take a generation. The people who grew up in the Soviet Union, they'd find it hard. You know, it is hard to face up to the past. But the next generation, they'd be able to look at the past and build to the future, and they'd be free. What's happening is the opposite. There's actually a generation who kind of were around in the '90s who, if you catch them on a non-propaganda day, will because they did actually were exposed to Stalin's crimes. And even Putin talks about Stalin's crimes. They have at least some sort of way of talking about the past. What's so weird in Russia is, is the next generation know even, know even less. Um, there's been some heroic attempts by people like Yuri Dud, this very famous blogger, to talk about you know, the Stalinist past. But if anything, the kind of the oblivion and the cancellation of the past is getting stronger rather than weaker. Um, and that's a very, very strange direction. To be, to be headed in. I mean, if you look at the other obvious parallel, Nazi Germany, you know, nobody talked in Germany about the Nazis in the 50s. Only in the 60s it opens up and then you have this reckoning. I mean, Russia is kind of doing the opposite of all these processes. So that was going to be my next question for you, which is if you just keep erasing, or, or I think erasing is not quite right, right? It's more of a, a rewriting. There was the, the official who said, well, Memorial makes us feel guilty for what happened to the Soviet Union, and instead we should be proud of our Soviet past. So, and then the same here with with school books, right? You're not you're not saying this never happened. You're changing the reasons that it happened and the impact that it had up to present day policy. If you continue to do that, including with not just within Russia, but there's another country or other countries involved, right? If like if if you just keep um, digging in and digging down and insisting on the rewrite, not only in domestic but also in geopolitical relations, what I guess, what happens? Is there a point at which it, it comes back around? Is there, do we have uh, any historical precedent for this? I think you've hit on a real cultural moment. And again, it's very interesting. Um, I mean, let, let's let's t- take this apart. If you obliterate the, the past, then you actually sort of lose the future. You know, that's, that's the kind of cost. If you can't <coughs> come to terms with what happened before, it's very hard to kind of do anything going forward. So there's a, it's a kind of a double relationship. Um, and you're kind of stuck in this eternal kind of like, I don't know, going round and round, itching your pain without being able to deal with it. Even as the past is being obliterated in in Russian discourse, uh, in political discourse, the future has disappeared. Putin never talks about the future anymore. And all you're left with is nostalgia, which is this kind of, you know, emotional space where you feel good and you feel great, but you can't really build anything with nostalgia. There could be a an even more subtle shift going on. Let's rewrite history. Let's also rewrite the history of 1989 and 1991. That's Putin's big kind of offer, isn't it? Or demand. We're going to rewrite 1991. We're going to reopen those borders. We're going to reopen the idea that countries can decide their own future. We're going to reopen the idea that actually the fall of the Soviet Union was a moment of liberation. Rewriting 89 and 91 might be a sort of priority for him. Uh, I suppose he does talk about it like Hitler about the Treaty of Versailles in similar ways. You know, we didn't really lose the war. We were tricked into losing the war. You know, we were cheated, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We've heard these narratives before. We're going through a lot of kind of, I don't know, challenging of origin myths everywhere in the world. And I don't know what that's connected to, whether it's in America, re-looking at the history of, of the founding of America or this new hit book by the late David Graeber saying everything about the way you've looked at the history of the world is wrong. So I don't know, are we in some weird moment where histories are being rewritten? Uh, and, and you know, that's a, I suppose that's a very 
exciting but a very dangerous moment. And so definitely what Putin is doing is kind of the dangerous side of that. You have Ukraine, which has its own cultural history and its own memory and its own attempt to create a future. Can a country in Russia's uh, on Russia's border sort of forge its own future, you know, create its own history with this other more powerful country um, to whom it is so important for this national project or this imperial project? Well, we have we have examples. I mean, you know, when I try to explain Ukraine to people, I often use the example of Ireland. I think it's very, very similar. You know, the same intermingling of elites and literatures with England, uh, as Ireland had with England, and and then, but then a, a very long and a deep rooted kind of desire for for independence, which has turned into a a perfectly viable statehood way beyond the English frame of reference. And you could even play around with Northern Ireland as the Donbass or something. So clearly, there is a history of you know, colonial neighbors separating off and 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 and, and having it, their own life, um, uh, but but this is a long struggle, and there is at the end of the day something very, you know, I mean, people keep on looking for like oh, if only there was an elegant treaty we could do that would be a way out, and right. I'm not against elegant treaties. I mean, there is a whole you know there's a whole industry of political scientists to support who can come up with elegant treaties, and one of them might work. I'm not a I'm not against the attempt of like staving off war for another couple of years. I, I don't think there's anything bad in in, in, negoti- in kind of negotiating to a point that the, the, the Ukrainians are happy with and the Russians. I mean, Ukrainians are ready to die. They're not dying to die. You know? <laughs> They're not suicidal. So, so I'm not against that. But at the end of the day, there is a fundamental disagreement here. Russia sees Ukraine as its. It doesn't think Ukraine is a real country. It thinks that Kharkiv, Odessa, Kiev are theirs. Ukrainians don't think that, or a lot of them, enough of them don't think that to make a coherent state. And this is a drama that's going to play out, you know, not, not over a couple of weeks, over winter, over, over many, many decades. And history shows that the right side sometimes win. And I think that's our best hope. We believe it on that somewhat optimistic note. Peter Pomerantz, thank you so much for being with me today.